is a graduate of Balliol College, Oxford, and of UCL, and he specialises in the history of France and the Ottoman Empire. He has published 11 books, including most recently on the subject of this afternoon's lecture, Levant, Splendour and Catastrophe on the Mediterranean. And he makes regular contributions to numerous publications, including the Daily Telegraph, the Spectator, and the International Herald Tribune. His TV and uh, radio appearances include a Channel 4 documentary on the subject of Harim and the 2012 BBC documentaries on Versailles. He is co-founder of the Society for Court Studies and publishes its journal and is a member of numerous <coughs> professional bodies including the Royal Historical Society and the Royal Society of Literature. In 2012, Philip Mansell was appointed, the, uh, was appointed Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres and in 2012 was the recipient on, on, uh, on the, of the London Library Life in Literature Award. And in addition to all of this, in 1995, Philip headed the campaign to save Clavel Tower, a ruined folly dating to 1831, which was threatening to fall off a cliff <coughs> into the bay below, and probably on top of several people, who knows. Thanks to his efforts, however, the tower was saved for the Landmark Trust and is now a very popular destination for visitors. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Philip Mansell. <laughs> Thank you very much all for coming and uh, to this talk on the Levant and uh, I just want to say there is a, a conference on the Levant in Istanbul in November and uh, please go to levantineheritage.com and my title today is Cities of the Levant, the Past for the Future. I want to talk about cities, we think much too much in terms of <coughs> races or states or religions. In fact, cities have their own dynamic. Their location, their population, and their economy could give them the power to ignore or defy a state. They are separate economic and cultural organisms, and the inhabitants may dislike each other, but they always need each other, or they wouldn't be living there. And at times, a city could ignore government decrees, and cities have outlasted states and religions, and sometimes had more impact. Alexandria outlasted the Ptolemies, Paris, the monarchy, which had made it capital of France. Cities, in fact, subvert cliches about nations and nationalism. In the same country, two cities can differ more from each other than they do from foreign cities. Think, for example, how different Marseille is from Lille or Izmir from Diyarbakir. Think of the similarities between Marseille and Naples or Izmir and Thessaloniki. And today I want to talk about some of the least national cities of all, the cities of the Levant, particularly Smyrna or Izmir, Alexandria and Beirut. And here you see a picture of Smyrna in about 1730. And these cities have the same appeal for the inhabitants in the Middle East, as pre-1933 Berlin did for Berliners. They symbolise the lost paradise, friendly to minorities, devoted to pleasure, which flourished before they were gutted by nationalism. And I'd like to quote Christopher Isherwood on Berlin in the years after he left it in 1933, because it reminds me of what some people from Beirut and Alexandria have told me. Always in the background was Berlin. It was calling me every night, and its voice was the harsh, sexy voice of the gramophone records. Berlin had affected me like a party, at the end of which I didn't want to go home. And eight characteristics distinguished the cities of the Levant. Geography, diplomacy, multilingualism, hybridity, trade, pleasure, modernity, and last vulnerability. Levantine cities were not national but world cities. They were precursors of and warnings to today's global cities. Levant means where the sun rises, the eastern Mediterranean. It is a geographical word free from associations with race or religion. It is defined not by frontiers 
but by the sea. The great Levantine cities, Smyrna, Alexandra and Beirut, and many smaller ports in the East Mediterranean, like Salonika or Jaffa, were windows on the world more open and cosmopolitan than inland cities. Through the sea and through maritime trade, Levantine cities were closer, both physically and mentally, to each other and to other ports than to cities in their own hinterland. For one thing, practically, it was safer and quicker to travel by boat between ports than by road to the hinterland. And this feeling was expressed in 1938 by the great Egyptian writer Taha Hussein, who is as representative of one Egypt as the Muslim Brotherhood. He claimed that the future of Egypt was Mediterranean, and I quote, there is no difference in mentality or culture between the peoples who live around the Sea of the Rum and have been influenced by it. And apart from geography, from being in the same area and by the sea, diplomacy was another major characteristic. A Western name for an Eastern area, the Levant was a dialogue at the heart of what Gibbon called the world's debate between Christianity and Islam. Dialogue trumped conflict, and usually deals came before ideals in the cities of the Levant. And the modern Levant was a product of an alliance, one of the most successful in history, that between France and the Ottoman Empire, between the Caliph of the Muslims and the most Christian king. It was based on a deal, on shared hatred of those two monarchies for Spain and the House of Austria, the Habsburgs ruling most of Europe. The union of the lily and the crescent, as one French ambassador called it, soon acquired commercial and cultural momentum. For with the alliance came capitulations, agreements between the Ottoman and the French government first, and then later other foreign governments like the Netherlands and Venice, which allowed foreigners to live and trade in the Ottoman Empire for the most part under their own legal systems. And this is still a toxic issue today. It's because the Shah of Iran gave Americans legal exemption inside Iran that Khomeini first denounced him and turned against him. And, it, and it's for that reason also that American soldiers left Iraq finally because they would not follow Iraqi law. As a result of the French Ottoman alliance, French consuls were appointed to most Levantine cities and it became quite a safe place in which to travel and trade. These were the years of the consuls. Janissaries guarded them from insult or attack. In Izmir in the 1670s, the great Ottoman writer Evliya Celebi was impressed by the power of the consuls. If someone hits an infidel, everyone immediately surrounds him and takes him and brings him to the consular judge or the infidels execute him. <coughs> and at that time, the Muslim people become invisible, so that at this time it seems a dark, frank place. This is the height of Ottoman power, but still the consuls were powerful. And this picture... It, it shows the Dutch consul, Monsieur de Hochepied, talking to the Kurdi or main judge of Izmir, and they are renewing and validating the capitulations. And please note the number of Dutch merchants or travellers in his train, including a priest. These are the interpreters, and in the background is this great trading port with a British, a French, and a Dutch ship, and the flags of the consuls flying on what is now the cordon of Izmir. So the picture is a sort of strip cartoon representing trade and diplomacy in a Levantine city. This is the, uh, the trading depots. This is the Muslim area climbing up the hill to Katife uh, Kale, which is still there in Izmir today. Our consuls were both servants of their own government and in effect local power brokers and transmitters of technology and information. Um, in the 19th century, for example, the British consul in Beirut was a power broker. Members of the Druze were already planning to be under British protection. Uh, the Shia were already looking to Iran, um, and consuls were 
great sources of, of information. For example, there's the books by Paul Rico, the British consul in Izmir, and in Beirut, books by uh, the Chevalier Darvia, who is a French consul, also in Smyrna. And uh, they became, really, they were the equivalents of modern international organizations. They brought efficient post offices, law courts, sometimes, of course, troops and warships to the Levant. They introduced quarantine and helped fight cholera. The British Consul General in Alexandria was a key figure, and it's because of an incident concerning him that was one reason why Britain invaded Egypt in 1882. And even today, as protection from their own governments, many <coughs> businessmen in the Levant are still eager to be consuls for foreign governments. Another characteristic of the Levant were multiple languages and international languages. Before the triumph of English, there were two world languages in the Levant. First, something called lingua franca, which was in effect pidgin Italian, very simple Italian, spoken, and I quote, uh, on, along all the coasts of the Levant by all the sailors and merchants who go to negotiate in the Levant. It was a business rather than a literary language, rarely written down. It was also spoken by rulers, by the Bay of Tunis, by Cervantes and Baron, who spent years in the Levant. And uh, the Gentleman's Magazine in 1837 wrote of an Englishman, he has talked lingua franca till he has half forgotten English. Um, characteristic phrases are, venna qui, come here, or Christiani sta forbi, Christians are cunning. And more Turks and Arabs learnt lingua franca in order to talk to foreigners than Europeans learnt Turkish or Arabic. It was not a cultural ghetto. And from 1840, the real, the second language, or for many the first of the Levant, was French. It was the language of science, of modernity, of diplomacy. It was spoken by pashas, by one or two sultans, by the entire royal family of Egypt, after about 1850, by Mustafa Kemal, the modernizer of Turkey, and by the poet from Smyrna, George Seferis. It was an official language of the Ottoman Foreign Office. And 5,000 French words, long before Kemal's reforms, invaded or were accepted by the Turkish language. Rather alluring words like maîtress, danseuse, and tirbouchon. They're all <laughs> Turkish words also. So it's another form of integration with the outside world, as well as diplomacy. And as a result, many Levantines were, and as I've heard for myself in Izmir, still are polyglot, speaking several languages, often in the same sentence. Combinations of French, Arabic, Turkish, Italian, Spanish, Greek, and English. The Smuha family, for example, who came from Baghdad via Manchester, to Alexandria around 1900, became millionaires in Alexandria. They now live near Geneva. They spoke at home something called Frarabish, French, Arabic, and English, all <laughs> jumbled together. And this is another picture showing the alliance, the diplomacy that was the foundation of the Levant. It shows the Grand Vizier in 1724, receiving the sons of the French ambassador in the Divan Hane in Istanbul, in Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, which you can still visit today. And please note the number of French people in the suite of the ambassador. They would be travelers, merchants, diplomats. And this was the height of the French uh, Ottoman alliance when the Grand Vizier himself said that the only difference between the two countries was religion. Maybe a slight exaggeration. But it's the beginning of Kyokari, of the introduction of pictures of Turkish fashions and of the Thousand and One Nights via a French translator who had worked for the French ambassador. Um, the next characteristic is hybridity. There were no ghettos, although communities would live near the church, the mosque, or the synagogue, the, the legal compulsion to do so was fairly weak. Um, travelers were attracted 
by the variety of race and costumes and the juxtaposition of mosques, churches, and synagogues, which was both contrary to the theory of Muslim law and inconceivable in any European city until our own lifetimes. Um, Beirut, the population was roughly half Christian and half Muslim. Alexandria, in the 19th century, about a quarter Christian and Jewish and three quarters Muslim. In Smyrna, well, the figures vary, but it's probably about 60% Muslim, 20% uh, Greek, and the rest uh, European, Jewish, and Armenian. In 1700, Smyrna had 50 mosques, eight synagogues, seven churches, and in many streets you felt you were in a Christian country. And here's another picture. This is Smyrna in about 1760. It is the formal <coughs> visit of a French admiral to the city. 1765, he's, uh, you see the way Ottoman ceremonial language has <coughs> embraced this group of Frenchmen. There, there's interpreters, there's janissaries, horses, ritual stops for perfume sprinkling, and so on. You can see this picture of the Musée de la Marine in Paris. Um, and by the way, the French admiral has an account of his tour of the Mediterranean, and he says, oh, the Ottoman Empire is completely rotten, it's going to collapse at any minute, everybody hates the Sultan. And of course, this is 1766. The system which collapses is the French monarchy, and not the Ottoman Empire, which goes on for 200 years. Um, and not just cities, but houses were hybrid in similar Ottoman Levantine <coughs> styles, often by the same teams of builders which fanned out across the area from the mountains of Albania and Macedonia. And look at these houses. Houses in this style would be all over the Levant, and you can still see them in some Turkish cities today. Um, an example of hybridity in, from Smyrna in the 17th century, there's the extraordinary false messiah, Sabatai Sivi, who founded his own religion with Christian and Muslim as well as Jewish elements. And of course, his enemies accused him of practicing free love. Well, he did certainly encourage his followers to present him with their daughters. And the Dernme, as his followers were called, are still a very important element in Izmir and Istanbul today. Uh, here is a typical, well not a typical, but a family of, of Smyrna, 1770, painted by Favre. It is a merchant, uh, his name's gone out of my head, he's a Frenchman, and you see how his, um, his father-in-law is dressed in Turkish style, his wife in Greek style, these are two children, one of whom married a French officer, the other an English Admiral, and this lady marries Mr. Moria, a Swiss merchant of Smyrna, and his mother of James Moria, the author of Haji Baba of Isfahan. And uh, this is a family which lasted in Smyrna until the 20th century. Uh, this is another lady of Smyrna, a Mrs. Baldwin, born Miss Maltas, painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds, no less, again wearing the Greek, smart Greek dress of the Levant, of Smyrna and Constantinople. You see the way um, Europeans would adopt local dress and many other local habits and eventually Greek words in their language and a Greek accent. This is the Baltazzi family of Smyrna, a very rich Greek family who bought up much land in Western Anatolia in the 19th century. They were Ottoman tax farmers. They were Ottoman, Greek, and European. And through the patronage of the Austrian ambassador, Count von Prokesh Austin, Hélène Baltazzi and Aristide Baltazzi moved to Vienna. And he transformed the bloodstock of horses of the Austrian Empire and helped found the Jockey Club in Vienna. And she, as some of you I'm sure realize, she married an Austrian diplomat, Baron Vetsera, and it's her daughter who was the last mistress of the Crown Prince Rudolf and committed suicide with him at Meiling in 1889. Um, 
These hybrid <coughs> families with many identities were not confined to Smyrna. There were also... Uh, this is a, another one. In the governor of Smyrna in the late 1890s, Kamil Pasha, who spoke four languages, Greek, Turkish, English and French, and managed to keep his city free from the terrible uh, horrors that afflicted the Armenians in Istanbul in 1895 and 6. So he really put the city above the empire and the decrees of the sultan. And it's when he was governor that um, many Turks wrote that going to Smyrna was like going to a foreign country. It was so different from the rest of the empire. Another hybrid character, one of the greatest figures of the Levant and indeed of Middle Eastern history, was Muhammad Ali Pasha, governor of Egypt from 1805 to 1849. Here he is painted by David Roberts, negotiating with British naval officers uh, in 1839, an overland route through Egypt. That is the Egyptian, not the British fleet in the background. He's in his palace in Ras al -Tin in Alexandria. So here are his interpreters and um, staff. And he deliberately modernized and internationalized the city of Alexandria. Uh, al Jabati, the great Egyptian chronicler, wrote that Christians, the enemies of our religion, have become the companions and intimate friends of his highness, and even employed Muslims as servants. And he consulted foreign consuls, he um, got his successors to learn French, and he built another visual representation of the Levant. First, his palace of Ras al -Tin. Unfortunately, you can't visit it yet, but it was a mixture of styles, both European and Ottoman. It soon acquired uh, European portraits and furniture. This is his interpreter, Bogos Bey from Smyrna, an Armenian from Smyrna who founded a great dynasty of diplomats in Egypt. And this is the square that was built under Muhammad Ali, the first modern square in the Middle East. And it began by being called the Place des Consuls because the consuls lived around it. It was then called the Place Muhammad Ali, and now I think it's called the Square of Freedom. It's a great meeting place in Alexandria. At the end was the house of the Greek consul, Mr. Tositsa, who came from the same part of Turkey as Muhammad Ali, the Balkans, uh, probably from Kavala, and probably spoke to him in Turkish, which most Greeks in the Balkans knew some words of. And already by 1843, this square, it was said, it was full of uh, smartly dressed people, and carriages of every description filled with smartly dressed ladies are to be seen driving about at all hours. And um, later, it had the first statue in a public place in the Middle East. 1873, an equestrian statue of Muhammad Ali Pasha looking towards Europe and the statue, despite all NASA's efforts to have it removed, the statue is still there. Um, so in fact it's become a place royale in a European style. And his uh, great-grandson, King Fuad, was also a typical Levantine. He had lived in Paris, Constantinople and Turin, as well as Cairo and Alexandria, and he had, uh, to quote a British diplomat, a taste for cosmopolitan company with a pro-Italian bias in matters of opera, investment and mistresses. <laughs> and in the spirit of the Levant, he came to the throne of Egypt in debt and died a multimillionaire. <laughs> I'm hard in his saying. Um, but he was also a great patron of the arts. He founded the Arab Language Academy. He ran Egypt uh, very efficiently, like a business. Uh, his friends included many Egyptian Jews. Like most Levantine communities, they enjoyed what has been called 
empowered marginality. They were marginal, but they were so powerful, and they felt thoroughly Egyptian, and if they thought of Zionism, regarded it, and I quote from a Zionist report of the 1920s, as very unchic. <laughs> and, and these multiple identities were also common, of course, in Beirut. Um, Alfred Sorsak, for example, a prominent businessman, also known as Farid, he was an Ottoman diplomat, equally at home in Paris, Constantinople, and Beirut. He would receive Jamal Pasha, the young type governor, in his Italianate palace in Beirut, but he was also preparing to work for France, which already had designs on Lebanon. And a recent example is the late Rafik Hariri. He was not only a Lebanese politician, he was also a Saudi businessman with Saudi nationality, a very rare privilege, and a friend and fundraiser for President Chirac of France. And Chirac now lives in a flat owned by the Hariri family in Paris. Um, in addition to hybridity, diplomacy, and geography, another characteristic of these cities was trade. They were not romantic cities, they were about money. They, were, they linked the economies of Europe and Asia. Smyrna exported figs, raisins, opium, and carpets, Alexandra cotton, Beirut emigrants. Thackeray wrote that he liked Smyrna because it had no monuments to visit. It produced no fatigue of sublimity. <laughs> what he liked was the human life. And the Corniche was the main place to visit in all these cities where the boats stopped. Izmir owed its rebirth to trade. It, it was the best uh, gulf and harbour on the west coast of Anatolia. And it's, the timing of its rebirth was due to merchants' desire to evade Ottoman customs dues. And it rose in the early 17th century like its contemporary port, New York, partly stimulated by the arrival of English and Dutch merchants. I quote from a French traveller, Smyrna is today for trade by both sea and land, the most famous city of all the Levant and the most famous market for every merchandise going from Europe to Asia and from Asia to Europe. Now here you see a Dutch picture about 1770 of the port of Smyrna just packed with boats. And when a European boat would arrive, then hundreds of smaller boats would surge onto it to try and get the goods and cut out any middlemen. And the, the commercial role of Smyrna before 1914 in the Ottoman Empire was something so phenomenal, so huge, it's quite hard to comprehend. It was a, a truly world city, something like Dubai or Hong Kong today. Um, the Cordon was expanded and enlarged, that is the Corniche, 1867 to 76 by Dussaufrère, a French company from Marseille, which also built Corniche in Port Said, in Trieste, in many other ports. And a musician in one of the cafes on the Cordon remembered, we had to know a song or two from each nationality to please the customers. We played Jewish and Armenian and Arab music. We were citizens of the world, you see. And uh, the first railways in the Ottoman Empire began in Smyrna, and in fact, Lord Stratford de Redcliffe, the British ambassador at the time of the Crimean War, he opened the first railway in 1856, and he dreamt in his speech of a railway stretching from Smyrna to Calcutta. And here you see the trade of um, Smyrna. One of the main products was dried fruit. You see the European businessman surveying the Turkish women workers. Quite unusual for Turkish women to be working outside the home at that time, I think. Another scene, please note the straw hats. Um, the best dried figs went to England, the second best to France. <laughs> And this is the port of Alexandria, you see also packed with boats. Um, and here is the palace of Rasultin, begun by Muhammad Ali and expanded 
and Italianized by his successors. And it is from that key that the last member of the dynasty, King Farouk, lived. Um, and Alexandra boomed like Smyrna. Its population, incredibly, rose from 5,000 in 1800 to 100,000 in 1850 and over 200,000 in 1882. I can't work out the percentage increase. It was the main port linking Egypt and Europe, the third port of the Mediterranean and the largest stock exchange outside Europe and North America. Now you see the port packed with ships and this is the stock exchange, the former house of the Greek consul. It has become the Bourse. You see that Alexandria is a bilingual city, French and Arabic. And uh, E.M. Forster wrote a famous description of walking past the Bourse and hearing a sound like devils screaming in hell. And here it is. It's this <laughs> cotton brokers with the price of cotton. This is a, a picture by a local artist called Margot Badran and uh, Margot Nahla, and probably, in my opinion, they were, they were mainly Greek. The cotton trade was dominated by Greeks, with Egyptians coming in later, and probably they were screaming in French to be better understood. Um, and Beirut also, it was described as a republic of merchants living according to its own laws, independent of the Pasha in Damascus. Its rise was also partly due to the arrival of foreign businessmen, foreign consuls, and, uh, and the balance in population between Muslims and Christians. It was a Levantine scala, a bastard, a mongrel, and its population also rose by about 500% in the 19th century. That's Beirut, about 1850, with Mount Lebanon in the background. This is... And another characteristic of these cities was pleasure. As much as trade, they were synonymous with pleasure. The Christian women of Smyrna, according to Evlia Chelebi, when the young Muslim men see their sweet-smelling and disheveled locks, their minds become ruined and confused. Combining the grace of Italians, the vivacity of Greeks, and the stateliness of Ottomans, they possess almost irresistible fascination. Sitting out in the evening in the Rue des Roses, they displayed lips like coral, eyes like fire, and looks which pierce your brain. I'm quoting from travelers' accounts. And this is the cordon of Smyrna. It's not just a trading center. As these uh, names indicate, it's for pleasure. You see the Théâtre de Smyrna, the Alhambra Café, the Sporting Club, the Sporting Club Theatre, and the Café de Paris. In his memoirs, the Turkish writer Najib Gundem wrote that it was the cordon that made Smyrna Smyrna. This is about the 1880s. From sunset till midnight, it was like a fairy tale country with a magic atmosphere which made the most somber and depressed souls end by laughing. If Smyrna is the eye of Asia, it was said, the key is the pupil of the eye. And the English writer Norman Douglas called Smyrna the most enjoyable place on earth. And it's in these cafes along the Cordon that the <coughs> Greco-Turkish Mediterranean Levantine music called Rembetico was born. It's a characteristic of Smyrna as jazz of New Orleans or tang tango of Buenos Aires. It was the music of rebels particularly appreciated by Abadais, or Tufts, as they were called. Um, they talk about the torments of love or the pleasures of hashish. Won't you tell me, won't you tell me where hashish is sold? The dervishes sell it in the upper districts. You stay up all night at the Café Chantant drinking beer, oh, and the rest of us you are treating as green caviar. That's one lament. Here's another view of the quays, great theatres in the distance is the Grand Hotel, Kramer Palace, the largest hotel of Smyrna. Another view, you see that most people are wearing European hats, no, no Ottoman fezes in sight except for among the boot blacks. On 
the right. And Alexandria also was synonymous with pleasure. I'm sure many of you have um, read the Alexandra Quartet, but there is other, more convincing evidence. The great novelist of Cairo was Naguib Mahfouz, but like many Karines, he would go every summer to Alexandria, and he noted a change after 1936 when capitulations were abolished. Before then, he had regarded it as a European city where Italian, French, Greek or English were heard more often than Arabic. The city was beautiful and so clean that one could have eaten off the streets, but all that was for the foreigners. We could only observe from the outside. Until the Treaty of 1936, which subjected foreigners to the same law as Egyptians. Foreigners were forced to change their attitude. They no longer owned the country. We Egyptians were no longer second-class citizens. They realised we would be appearing before the same magistrates. We began to feel more at ease. The characteristics of European life became accessible to us as well. So there is this great desire, not hostility towards, but desire for European life. He went to Greek restaurants like Athenaeus, famous for its classical orchestra, and Thé Dansant. It's still there today. In short, Alexandria was a European city, but belonged to us Egyptians. And he remembered Alexandria as a city where popular joy shone everywhere. And this is a picture by a Muslim Alexandrian, Mahmoud Saeed, about 1930. It's called In the Dance Club. And these dance clubs were um, famous in Alexandria. Long before the Alexandria Quartet, uh, uh, people were talking of the women of Alexandria. Modern to the tips of their delicate little feet, they had a furious desire to break with every prejudice, to taste every sensation. And the same cult of pleasure was also in Beirut. According to the French consul, the Chevalier d'Arvieux, Beirut was different from other ports like Sidon and Tripoli. This is already in the 17th century. By love of drinking and singing, all the citizens of Beirut, whatever their religion, live well together. They are polite, visit each other, and arrange parties of pleasure. Even the people is not as wicked as in Sidon. And this is what everybody who knew the city before 1975 confirms. They always use the same phrase. The best years of my life it was paradise, and it is again becoming a capital of pleasure, a centre of Arab pop music with singers like Firuz and Nancy Ajram, many of whose cities celebrate Beirut itself. Another characteristic is modernity. There you see Beirut, the Place des Canons, which was the centre of uh, bars and cafes, before the 1970s. Um, these cities were also distinguished by their extraordinary modern schools, often run by American or French missionaries. Um, Smyrna illuminates like a beacon all the other provinces of the Ottoman Empire, wrote the Austrian Consul General. And this is a photograph of Latife Hanum, the wife of Mustafa Kemal, the first Turkish woman, or one of the first Turkish women, to be unveiled in public, she, was, she began her education at a French language school in Smyrna. And Smyrna also had the Ottoman Empire's first newspaper, first American school, first electricity, first public cinema, and first football club. Alexandra also had Egypt's first theatres, first feminist newspaper, first Stock Exchange, and in Kavafi, the first publicly published homosexual poet outside France. And uh, this is Queen Farida, the first wife of King Farouk. You see, she's a completely modern person in the 1940s, and she was educated at a modern school in Alexandria, the Dame de Sion. And Alexandria also had many other famous modern schools, for example, Victoria College, founded by Lord Cromer in 1906, which also educated opponents as well as supporters of Britain. 
people like George Antonius, who wrote the first account in English of Arab nationalism from an Arab point of view, the Arab awakening of 1938. Uh, Beirut, here's modern Beirut in the 1930s. This is the Saint Georges Hotel. Um, and Beirut also had the American University of Beirut, a famous modernizing force for uh, many of its students. It's in Beirut that the Arab literary renaissance began in the 1870s. Edward Said wrote that in Beirut everything seemed possible, every idea, every identity. For May Kosu, Beirut exuded optimism and the most disadvantaged believed in its promises. And President Shamoun told Tia Larson, everything is permitted in Beirut except poverty, and that is never forgiven. Beirut was so tolerant and open that despite two Arab-Israeli wars before the 1970s, the number of Jews living in Beirut was increasing. Um, but the problem that this, the, with Levantine cities was that perhaps a bit more than other cities, they were vulnerable. They were cities on the edge. Looting and burning, race and religious hatred were always ready to erupt. Some see them as urban titanics doomed to disaster. For example, in 1882, there were riots in Alexandria. These were used, although more Egyptians than uh, non-Egyptians died in them, in fact, the Greeks of Alexandria were well equipped with guns and were quite well organized and absolutely determined to kill Egyptians. But it was used by Britain as a pretext for um, attacking Alexandria and invading Egypt. And in fact, British troops would not leave till 1956. On 11th of July, 1882, British warships opened fire. The main sounds were the crackle and roar of flames, the crash of falling buildings, and the howling of dogs. A British observer wrote that it was a Dantesque inferno, a light almost from end to end, the flames running riot from street to street without any attempt being made to check them. With wild figures here and there pillaging and looting and ghastly corpses lying charred and naked in the roadways. And this is a photograph of Alexandra after the Royal Navy had done its work. And this bombardment changed everything. Uh, and the British-backed Egyptian government after 1882 made the Egyptian taxpayer pay compensation for the bombardment which, in fact, Britain had uh, performed. And there were, none of these cities had a real municipality with a real National Guard or, or um, effective police force which could resist disorder. Uh, from the start of the municipality of Alexandria, for example, there were complaints that um, members did not know Arabic. Public documents were in French and Arabic, but internal municipal documents were always in French. Beirut City Council was and still is divided along confessional lines, as it has been since its foundation in 1832. And the 20th century was bad for hybridity. Um, and, of course, Smyrna was the prime example. Here's another uh, photograph of Alexandria after 1882. Please <coughs> note there are not even dogs or cats in the streets. Uh, there was increasing resentment from the hinterland, both in uh, Beirut and, above all, in Smyrna, about the wealth of the city. There were many kidnappings of uh, merchant sons in return for ransoms. And here are some Zaybeks or Turkish uh, militiamen to some or brigands to others who roamed the mountains outside the city and often kidnapped people. And nationalism led to the Greek invasion of 1919. It began very badly with the murder of several hundred Turks, and 1922, 
The Greek army retreats in Anatolia. It destroys Manisa, loots and kills many cities. And uh, finally, the Turkish army reconquers the city on the 9th of September, 1922. And consuls had often organized uh, transfers of power, for example, in Salonika in 1912, relatively peacefully, but the years of the consuls were over in the 20th century. A fire was deliberately started. Uh, this uh, is one aspect of Smyrna, the Turkish governor in the war, Rahmi Bey, who is with the Genife family and some French officers liberated on parole. So the city remains extremely peaceful in the First World War, and in fact so peaceful that some English firms manufactured uniforms for the Turkish army. <laughs> Their argument was that it was more patriotic to keep market share than to fight for Britain. <laughs> I'm not sure they were exactly wrong. Um, <clears throat> but that governor was replaced by Nureddin, who was an Islamist, as you can tell by his beard, and appointed by Mustafa Kemal. And the result was a fire was started. Soon it was two miles long and a hundred feet high. And this picture, it's an unknown location. It is by an artist of Smyrna called Ovidi Kurtovich of Dalmatian origin. It is an extraordinary representation of the city. You see Tadife Kale up here. This wall of fire is what people talk about. And then, here it is, a film from Allied boats in the harbour. Um, such frantic screaming of sheer terror as can be heard miles away, according to George Ward Price. You see the hotels burning. The world failed to protect a world city. Those civilians uh, who did not have foreign passports mainly Greeks and Armenians, who had not been murdered or deported, were finally taken away by ships um, organized by American missionaries. Nationalism had defeated Smyrna's Levantine combination of diplomacy, hybridity, commerce, modernity, and pleasure. All those qualities don't have armies to protect you. And ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, who, who knew Salonika, knew the Ottoman Empire very well, he denounced the spirit of the Levant, which ruins individuals and societies, I quote. In reality, it's not the spirit of the Levant, it is nationalism. All nationalism corrupts, absolute nationalism corrupts, absolutely. And indeed, these ships, for a time, refused to take on, they were so nationalistic, they refused to take on refugees, although in the end, they did. Um, meanwhile, Mustafa Kemal was in, in a villa on a hill above the city, courting Latifi Hanim, and to whom he said, and she checked that he said it with one of his ADCs, let it burn, let it crash down. He found the city marble and left it ashes. There you see it burning. It's the first city death of the 20th century, the earliest and richest of Levantine cities. And the Allied warships were in the harbour. They could have trained their, game, their guns on um, the city to stop the fire, but um, it was 1922. They wanted no more wars. And the Turkish and Jewish quarters were generally spared. Those are the refugees. And this is the statue which Mustafa Kemal had put up on the site of the Grand Hotel Kramer Palace in uh, Izmir. It is still there, a symbol of the 20th century. Relations between Greeks and Jews in Smyrna had not been good. However, on the 8th of January 1923, a Jewish teacher wrote this Levantine lament. Life in Smyrna has become worse than what we experienced in Morocco before the French occupation. Dull, monotonous, without any material or 
moral destruction. Theatres, cinemas, cafes, clubs, where newspapers from the entire world were available, where we found every kind of instructive and agreeable distraction, all have disappeared, annihilated by the fire. And the same thing happened slowly in Alexandria, much more peacefully after 1956, and under Nasser's uh, dictatorship, and partly as a result of the Franco-British Israeli invasion, most non-Egyptians left Alexandria, and many Egyptians also. Same thing in Beirut after 1975 with the Civil War. And perhaps these cities have a lesson for our global cities in the future or now, because our cities are re repeating the pattern of Levantine cities. In two ways, London, Paris, New York, Dubai, at first they've welcomed thousands from Smyrna, Beirut, and Alexander themselves. For example, Mohamed El Fayed, Alain de Botton, Omar Sharif, Edouard Balladur uh, from Alexandria and Beirut, uh, uh, Smyrna. This is Monsieur de Hochepied, the last of the Dutch family of Smyrna, who is consul in Istanbul in the 1950s. This is Dario Moreno, a Jewish singer of Izmir, one of the last great singers of Izmir. And this is Alec Isigonis, born in Smyrna, who, the creator of the Mini in England. He and his family, they had British passports, they could get out. And he never talked about Smyrna again. But he did coin the phrase, rather good for a refugee, less is more. And not only have they drawn up much of the talent of the Levant in the Middle East, they are also repeating the pattern of Levantine cities. London, Paris, New York, Hong Kong and other global cities are increasingly different from their hinterlands. They too act as educators, liberators and modernizers and put deals before ideals and contain mosques, churches and synagogues. London is now called the most diverse city in the world. 45% British, white British, 18% Asian, 13% black, 13% European and 9% other. And it is called the new capital of the world, the undisputed capital of the world, a first-rate city with a second-rate state attached. <laughs> <laughs> and it has these new law courts for foreigners, like the law courts for Russians, who, who prefer these courts than their own. And the mayor, of course, <laughs> it has political ambitions. He's using the city as a power base, as many other mayors. I mean, the present prime minister of Turkey began as mayor of Istanbul. And these multiple identities are reappearing. For example, like Hanif Qureshi, the author of London, or Amin Malouf in Paris, or Nedim Gyosel, a French-speaking Turkish author in Paris, who thinks of himself as living in Paris, Istanbul. <laughs> and creativity. H Hong Kong, for example, is a new Levantine city with some of the best schools in the world. It is where China meets the world. It is a special administrative region, increasingly different from its Chinese hinterland. It is even learning to value the much maligned colonial past because a British colony gave greater freedom and dignity to its inhabitants than the Chinese national state. And the colonial flag is sometimes flown at anti-Peking protests. And if they have a warning for us, it is perhaps that in the end, even the richest cities depend on armed force, on the protection of the police and the army. But if our cities continue to be supported by their states, then surely the future belongs to mixed cities with the energy and freedom of cosmopolitanism rather than to inland capitals. To Beirut, not Damascus. Istanbul, not Ankara. Hong Kong, not Peking. New York, not Washington. I would like to conclude with the prophetic words of a historian of ancient Gaul called Camille Julien. And here the 19th century speaks to the 21st across the horrors of the 20th century. In his great history of Bordeaux, 
And Bordeaux was also like a Levantine city, different from the hinterland, putting trade before patriotism and uh, a lust for pleasure. Anyway, Julien suggested, and I quote, today, in the face of an absolute and monotonous state, in face of even colder and more despotic international ideas, the municipal spirit can become, in the same way as family life and love of the soil, the safeguard of human liberty and dignity. We should not only cultivate our gardens, we should also cultivate our cities. Thank you very much. I'd just like to um, ask my colleague, uh, David Jacobson, editor of the Palestine Exploration Quarterly, to give a quick vote of thanks, and then I fear our time is up. Well, um, I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was a really scintillating talk, illustrated by the most marvellous picture. I mean, that alone is an amazing achievement uh, here. I think uh, I'd just like to say something about this marvellous talk in that it really reflects on one of the, one of the uh, unfortunate aspects of the 20th century. Such cities with uh, these hybrid populations and so on also occurred along the Baltic, in Riga, in uh, Memel, uh, in Königsberg, and of course the Black Sea as well, Odessa. And, but here we have uh, a lecture that's focused magnificently on the Levant and on these uh, amazing cities of, the, of that area. And let's hope that they will regenerate and recover some of that glory. Anyway, I'd like to thank you. There's plenty of food for thought. I only wish we had qu uh, time for questions. But I'd like, unfortunately, we don't. So I'd like to, um, on you, uh, I'd like us all to thank uh, Philip uh, uh, Mansell for this wonderful talk. <laughs>